Good afternoon everyone. Thank you for joining me for this review video. I have presented all the conic sections in individual videos. Today we're just going to do an analysis review of each of the various conic sections that I have addressed in this channel. I want to start and in an itemized version we will go through all of these uh, various sections. But I want to start with the most basic conic section and that's just a point. A point can be representative of, of a intersection of two lines and that in itself is a conic section. So do not be fooled that a point is just a point but it is also a re representation of a type of conic section. A point basically x comma y would be nothing more than a two dimensional representation of a, an intersection of two lines. It can also be just a, a point. It doesn't even have to represent an intersection of lines. It can just be a single point in space the tip of a cone. If you have a three-dimensional cone, right, the three-dimensional cone and let's draw it out right here, the very tip of this can represent that point and that in itself would be a conic section right over there. So there's nothing more to a point than just and it being a an x and y coordinate pair representing that point in space. So keep this in mind as a conic section because this indeed is a form of a conic section. Next, of course, going off from the easiest to something more involved, we have the line. The line is the conic section which happens to take the form y is equal to mx plus b. It's not a hard conic section. If you look at this side over here and you look at it at a certain cross section, you do have a conic section over here representing a line. So that in itself is a conic section. If, for example, you have something which looks something like 8y is equal to 3x, let's just say 4 plus 8y equals 3x. If you convert everything into y equals mx plus b, you convert this non-standard form into a standard form and we should do that. If you take the 4 on the other side, you get 8y is equal to 3x minus 4 and now you still have to take the 8 on the other side to convert it into this standard form. You get 3 over 8x minus 1 over 2. Just by converting everything Converting a linear equation to a standard form gives you two things right away. If you've done this properly in the y equals mx plus b format, you get very clear indication of two things and those two things are the slope. The slope over here is, is the coefficient of x which is 3 over 8. It's, it's a relatively flat slope because you have a small number dividing by a large number. A bigger number divided by a smaller number would represent a steep slope. This has more of a horizontal dimension to it and a, and a lower vertical dimension. The change in y divided by change in x is relatively flat over here. The other item you determine is the y-intercept. The y-intercept is just basically basically just your b value. The b value over here is just this. It's minus 1 over 2. But how do you represent the y-intercept? The y-intercept is always going to be here in the form of 0 comma b. So for this specific equation your y-intercept is going to be 0 comma minus 1 over 2. So this right here represents this system or here or you can just say equation of a line represents a conic section which happens to have a slope of 3 or 8 and a y-intercept of 0 comma minus 1 or 2 and this right here represents that same line but in the standard form. So keep in mind point and line are two forms of conic sections. Next we look at something a little bit more elaborate. Everything you've already seen in my previous videos. If you take a three-dimensional cone and you slice it horizontally like a perfect horizontal slice, you end up with a conic section called a circle. This here represents an equation of such a circle. The procedure for you finding the true equation of that circle in terms of being able to derive the center of that circle and the radius is you have to look at something like this and think about completing the square. And we have seen examples of these in the previous videos. You have to look at it in terms of the various groupings you can have, the x square and the y square grouping, and you have to individually complete these squares to convert this into the standard form for the circle which has representation of a translation going on. And this would be that form which is no longer centered about the origin because that would just be x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared but this represents horizontal and vertical translation of that center. Anyhow you have to look at this in that form and you do that by completing the square. So individually you have to complete the squares for these groups and when you do complete the square these are the groupings that you get, x squared plus 2x plus 1 and then this other one y squared minus 4y plus 4 and you know how to complete the square. These constants 1 and 4 add up to this side exactly as you see them. You complete the square over here in this next step you get x plus 1 whole square plus y minus 2 whole square 
is equal to 15 plus 1 plus 4, which would be 20. When you look at the center over here, you think about this as your center, minus 1 comma 2. And your radius, this here represents r square. Therefore, the radius must be the square root, the square root of 20, which would be 2 root 5. So the radius is 2 root 5 and the center is minus 1 comma 2. Again, you have to be very wary of these signs. You could view this x plus 1 whole square as x minus minus 1 whole square, a translation of 1 to the left. And you could have viewed this second part as y minus plus 2 whole square, because that would have retained that minus. And you would think of this as a plus 2 vertical translation upwards. Therefore, the center is minus 1 comma 2. See, minus 1 comma 2. And this over here would represent the equation and when you analyze this equation you obtain a center of minus 1 comma 2 and a radius of 2 comma 5 then you can individually if you wanted you could graph it out you could even determine x and y intercepts so here represents an equation of a certain conic section and when you're seeing like either an x square or a y or you're seeing a y square and an x where one is a second degree uh, variable in terms of exponent and the other one is a single order or single degree you should always be thinking about a parabola this right here represents an equation of a parabola and the fact that you're having a constant over here represents there's some sort of translation going on. So you should really be thinking of this. y square is equal to 4px. Or you can think of it in terms of translation y minus k whole square is equal to 4p into x minus h. So this is what we're thinking about. You want to convert this into one of these forms. If you take the four minus 4x on the other side, you get y square is equal to a positive 4x and you still have to take the 4 on the other side minus 4 and then you want to rearrange everything into the proper format as that equation shows you would get y square is equal to you would isolate a 4 and you get an x minus 1 but it still is not in this form we still have to determine the p and you could say y square is equal to 4 times 1 because 4 times 1 would retain that 4 value and you'd have x minus 1 when you're looking at this, now you have your standard form over here. This is really a y minus 0 whole square, but there's no need to put a minus 0. Only the x component of the vertex has translated, the y component has not translated. But when you're looking at this, you can automatically tell your vertex is basically 1 comma 0. And your p-value right here, p-value which represents how much from the vertex your focal point lies on one side and the directrix on the other side, your p-value is 1. When you know you're looking at an equation of this form, you're looking at a right and left parabola. The fact that there's no minus sign where it tells you it's a right-facing parabola. And that tells you that from the vertex, you're one unit away, one unit away from the focal point. The focal point over here would just be 1 plus 1, 2 comma 0. And the directrix would be on the other side. Remember, if this represents your 1 comma 0 and you're looking at a, a parabola in this form, the focal point is right here and the directrix is going to be on the left side of that vertex. Your directrix is going to be exactly one unit but to the left of this x coordinate because you have a x-word direction going on over here because it's a right and left facing parabola. Your directrix here would be x is equal to zero because one minus this one gives you a zero. So your y-axis over here is your directrix. So now that we've determined all of these things, it makes sense next to determine the lattice rectum endpoints. You know the lattice rectum goes from one side of the curve to the other side but through the focal point. All you gotta do is plug this x value of the focal point because the lattice rectum is going through it and you put it into this formula. And when you put it into this formula you get 4 times 1 times 2 minus 1 which is just a 1. And this is always equaling here your square component which happens to be y square. So you can say y square is equal to 4 therefore y is equal to plus and minus 2. Now that you've determined y is equal to plus and minus 2, you already know your lattice rectum endpoints because the x coordinate value is still 2. It'll be 2 comma minus 2 and 2 comma positive 2. So here 2 comma minus 2 and 2 comma positive 2. If you determine the length of this lattice rectum using the distance formula, if you determine the length of this, you can see that the, uh, the segment, uh, let's just say the distance of the lattice rectum segment will be equal to 4 times your p-value. That's always a test. The length of the lattice rectum is always 4 times the value of your p. And if you look at the distance formula, formula y2 minus y1 whole square plus x2 minus x1 whole square, and you take the square root of that, if you did all of that, you'll determine that the length of this rectum, lattice rectum is 4. Because think about it, the x-values are 2 and 2, they'll zero out. And 2 minus minus 2 is a 4. 
4 squares is 16, the square root of that 16 you'll get as your distance of your lattice rectangle will be 4 and you know your p-value here is a 1 which is same thing as 4 times 1. So here your distance of the lattice vector is equal to 4 times your p-value and that's a good way of determining if your these values over here are right because if you determine the segment of this the length of this segment it should be 4 times your p-value and another good point is if you take the midpoint of this it should equal to your focal point because the focal point is located right between your lattice vector. So if you were to look at the midpoint formula x1 plus x2 divided by 2 comma y1 plus y2 divided by 2 and you look at the midpoint of this what do you get as your midpoint? 2 plus 2 is a 4 divided by 2 is a 2 minus 2 plus 2 is a 0 divided by 2 is a, is a, a 0 2 comma 0 is your midpoint which is exactly the same as your focal point. So this right here is your parabolic conic section of this formula over here or equation here having the vertice, vertex 1 comma 0 p value of 1 focal point is 2 comma 0, directrix is x equals 0, lattice rectum points are these, the lattice rectum segment is 4 times your p-value and the lattice rectum midpoint is the same as your focal point so everything tests out. It's a right facing parabola with a positive value over here because it's not left facing, it's right facing so it faces towards the right, it has a positive sign over here, it's not negative by any means. So let's look at uh, ellipse as our next example. So this right here represents a conic section of an ellipse. If you just look at this equation, you can see there's a positive x squared component and a positive y squared component. It should be representative of an ellipse because you take every constant on the other side and you'll make it equal to 1. But when I work this out, you'll see it. You want to get the x components together, you want to get the constant on the other side. So you'll do 4x squared minus 16x plus y squared is equal to minus, minus 15. Complete the square over here for the x component. You can do you can isolate 4 and you can do x square minus 4x plus y square is equal to minus 15. Complete the square over here. What are you gonna get? You're gonna get 4 into x square minus 4x plus 4 plus y square is equal to this 4 will multiply by with this 4 to give you a positive 16. So you have to do minus 15 plus po positive 16, and now you get x minus 2 whole square plus y square is equal to 1. You have to convert this into what you're seeing over here, a representative ellipse equation for x minus h whole square over a square plus y minus k whole square over b square equaling a 1. Here you got an equal, here you got your positive. We have to get rid of this coefficient and the way you can do that is by pretending if it was down as a denominator. But if it was in the denominator, look what I'm doing over here. 1 square is equal to 1. Look over here, I've gone my a square and I've gone my b square. If you were to open this up, you get a 1 over 4. And if you were to flip around, you get your 4 over 1. You get your 4 on top. So this exactly is what you're seeing. Except when I'm looking at this, I have a smaller number here and a larger number here. With ellipses, the a represents a larger number and b represents a smaller number denominator number and when you have something like this with the x squared divided by the b squared and the y squared or the a squared you're looking at a vertically directed ellipse a vertically directed ellipse and that's exactly what we got going on here a vertically directed ellipse because a larger denominator number must always be the a when i'm looking at this i'm seeing a is equal to one b is equal to one over two and i know for ellipses c squared is equal to a squared minus b squared if you work, work this out by plugging in one square and half square and you do all of that, you'll get c value as root 3 over 2 because you'll get the square root of 3 over 4. See, 1 square minus 1 over 4, which is half square, is a 3 over 4 and you do the square root of that, you get root 3 over 2. So what are our points over here? Our center of this ellipse is what we have over here, 2 comma 0. And you know ellipses are vertices, they are two vertices. It's a vertically directed ellipse, for vertically directed ellipse, so everything is going to be in terms of the y coordinates. You're going to move one coordinate because a is, my, a is representing my vertex. You're going to move one point up and one point down, 2 comma minus 1 and 2 comma 1. What about my focal points? It's going to be root 3 or 2. Remember in an ellipse the focal point is always located within the center and the vertex, within. So it's going to be again in the y direction, a vertical direction, because it's a vertically directed uh, ellipse. 
So it's going to be 2 comma 0 minus root 3 over 2 which is just minus root 3 over 2 and 2 comma 0 plus that root 3 over 2 which is just root 3 over 2. Minor axis endpoints here are going to be minor axis always perpendicular I meant to say to your major axis. Here your major axis is vertical the minor axis is horizontal and it's going to be in an x dimension right enough dimension based on that 2 value and everything is going to be half point to the right and half point to the left so you're going to say your minor axis endpoints are 3 over 2 comma 0 which is your 2 minus half and 5 over 2 comma 0 which is your 2 plus half 5 over 2 comma 0 so you basically have a, a, a ellipse over here if you were to draw it it has a center at z 2 comma 0 it has a vertex vertices at 2 comma 1 and 2 comma minus 1 and we're not drawing things to scale all right, we're not drawing things to scale right here. The focal points will be right here somewhere inside. And your minor axis endpoints will be right over here. So you basically have an ellipse which looks something like this. An ellipse. And if you want to be a little fancy, you can determine the eccentricity of this ellipse, C over A. What's centricity over here? It's C divided by A. What's my C? Root 3 over 2 divided by 1. So it's root 3 over 2. It's equal to root 3 over 2. And if you were to take the calculator value of root 3 over 2, it's 0.86, around 0.86. Let's look at it. 3 square root divided by 2, 0.866. So it's relatively close to 1 and far away from 0. Because the eccentricity of ellipses is always from 0 to 1. Closer you are to 1, the more ellipsoidal it is. The closer you are to 0, the more circular it is. But here's the analysis of this conic section ellipse. This was our basic equation. We converted here, it here into this standard form of equation. The only trickiest part was here dealing with this coefficient 4. You have to think of it as being 1 or 2 square. Because you flip it on, you get that 4. Everything was already equal to 1, so you didn't have to divide anything. And then from there, we determined the A and the B and the C values. And from there, we determined the center, the vertices, the focal point, the minor axis endpoints, the eccentricity. And you can do a graph. Not a difficult question. Remember, ellipses can be horizontally directed or they can be vertically directed. The exact same representation over here for a horizontally directed would have had an x minus h whole square over a square and a plus y minus k whole square over b square. Okay, so keep all of these differences in mind. And for an ellipse, c square is always equal to a square minus b square because in an ellipse, the focal point is always located within the center and the vertex. Therefore, the a value is always larger and c value is always smaller. Okay, for ellipses, you always have to remember a value is always larger than the C value for an ellipse. Okay, let's look at our last conic section, the hyperbola next, and that'll be the end for this video. So when you look at this, which represents a hyperbola, a hyperbola conic section, when you're looking at the x squared component and the y squared component, and you're seeing this little minus in between, you should be thinking about a hyperbola because circles have uh, equations where you have an x squared and a y squared. They're both positive. Same with the ellipse you have both a positive x square and a positive y square. But in hyperbola, you'll have a one positive and you'll have one minus. And you see here, you're seeing that minus over here. When you're looking at this, you should always be thinking about completing the square. That's just a freak, uh, technique which is too commonly involved in these type of questions. And you know how to complete the square. I'll just complete the square over here. You'll get a minus 4x plus 4 and here you'll get a minus 4 into you you can even be fancy and say y minus 0 whole square you take the 4 on the other side because you generated a constant here you take the 4 on the other side and this completes 2 x minus 2 whole square minus 4 into y minus 0 whole square gotta make this a little more clean x minus 0 whole square is equal to 4 when you divide everything by 4 because the equation for hyperbola and uh, ellipses must always be equal to 1, you'll get rid of that coefficient. But what are we looking at over here in terms of an equation? We're looking at basically something like x, x, let's, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about here in terms of translation, x minus h whole square minus y minus k whole square is equal to 1. Now we have to see, do you have an a square or do you have a b square or whichever? We have to determine that. When you divide everything over here, I'm getting a x minus 2 whole square over 4 and I'm getting a minus y 
let's for simplicity sake make it y square over 1 is equal to 1 you see these fours cancel out to give you that one and now over here if we take this one step further we can get over here x minus 2 whole square over 2 square minus y square over 1 square is equal to 1 remember the a value must always be larger than the b value if you see a larger number over here you have to associate that with the a and remember with regards to ellipses and uh, hyperbolas the differences lie in the equation forms for for the ellipse you'll always have the positive but you'll always have the x square or a square or you can have x square or b square the x can land on top of the either a or the b with a hyperbola you'll always have x square or a square minus y square or b square or you can have y square or a square minus x square or b square the point I'm trying to make is in a hyperbola the first term over here must always have the a square and the second term must always have the b square with an ellipse you can have b square here and a square here because it doesn't matter because you have pluses in the ellipses with a minus the b square must always be attached to the minus component and the a square must always be attached to the positive component for the hyperbola anyhow here what we when we look at look at this equation form we know here clearly a is equal to 2 b is equal to 1 c with the, with the hyperbola c square now is always equal to a square plus b square no longer minus b square plus plus b square because in a hyperbola focal points are located outside of the vertices in a hyperbola the c value is always larger than the a therefore you have a square plus b square so if you do a square plus b square and you square root that you get root 5 and that clearly tells you your c value a's a values give you your major axis endpoints b values give you your minor axis endpoints c values give you your focal points what's the center over here the center over here is basically two comma zero now i'm again getting a two comma zero over here my center and my fo uh, vertices are going to be based off on this uh, value over here and this is a horizontally directed hyperbola because I have the x component with the a component. If I had the y component with the a component, it would be a vertically directed hyperbola. But this is a horizontally directed hyperbola. So I'm gonna be moving in a left and right direction by a units for the vertices. So two minus two is a zero comma zero and two plus two a four comma zero. Those are my major axis endpoints. What about my focal points? Focal points are gained in the right and left direction, but even further away from the center than the vertices because the C value is larger than A. It'll be, it'll be 2 minus root 5, 2 minus root 5 comma 0, and 2 plus root 5 comma 0. How about my minor axis endpoints? For hyperbola, it's always, it is always perpendicular to the major axis. The major axis here is horizontal, therefore the minor axis is vertical. And that I'm going to be looking in a, in a y direction, up and down direction, but by b units. Plus and minus 1 from this 0. So my minor axis endpoint will be 2 comma minus 1 and it will be 2 comma 1. There's another thing we should be looking at here are basically going to be our uh, asymptotes. The asymptote for a horizontal directed hyperbola is going to be y minus k is equal to plus and minus b over a into x minus h your asymptotes. When you plug in these y, k, b, a, x and h values which you have basically before you because the center is always h comma k, you can get your asymptotes of this form. We know there's no uh, k value because the center is a 2 comma 0 so your asymptote equation let's put it over here will be y is equal to plus and minus b over a which is a 1 over 2 into x minus h which is x minus 2 that's my asymptote the two asymptotes one is a positive slope one is with a minus slope those are my two asymptotes so we basically have pretty much everything done over here once we started here with this basic equation we converted it into this standard form over here the standard form basically mirrored this form over here and then from here we got our a value b value and then we also determined our c value using a square plus b square you could have taken this one step further and determined the eccentricity which is c over a eccentricity c over a would be root 5 over 2 root 5 over 2 and you can get a calculator value for that it's going to be something larger than 1 root 5 divided by 2 and it's 1.11 so it's an eccentric hyperbola remember with, with, with hyperbolas 
the values for eccentricity are are larger than one. They're not between zero and one like ellipses because here the C value is larger than A value. So you have values larger than one. With ellipses, the A values are larger than C values. Therefore, your range is between zero and one. Okay, so here's our eccentricity. And anyhow, we got our A value, B value, C value. We got our center, the vertices, the focal points, and we got our asymptotes, and we got our minor axis endpoints. Just remember with the ellipse, the focal points are located within the center and that uh, vertices and for a hyperbola the focal point is, focal points are located outside of the vertices so they're further away from the center than are the vertices so this was just an analysis review of the several conic sections we've looked at and i hope this video captured it all i didn't graph or here there's no need to graph you just analyze it and that was all we were looking at so feel free to look through this video once or twice just so you can cement all the points as needed Thank you for watching. Have a nice day. Bye.